Um, let me get my notes here ready. Before um, we start the oral argument, I um, would confess that sometimes in my, when I attempt to ask a question, I end up using up so much of counsel's time. So today I'm gonna to ask my question for both counsel to listen to before I start the clock and you may or may not wish to uh, address it. Um, I would direct your attention to the statute that we are to look at today. 768.1355, sub one, sub A, there is the language of ordinary, reasonably prudent person. As I read McCain and the other cases from the Supreme Court of Florida, that is the language of the common law rule involved in, in tort litigation, which generally requires a trier of fact to determine and um, I am concerned about whether or not this statute takes away that determination from a jury. There is a footnote in the case of LA Fitness that talked about the Good Samaritan uh, Act. And that act also had the ordinarily reasonable person in it. And the fourth district in that case pointed out that while it may have been the legislature's intent to do something, they're not certain that they actually did it. So as you can see, I would have taken up a lot of your time by promulgating that question and maybe inappropriately using your time. But sometimes I know counsel wants to know what's on the court's mind. And at least for me, that is on my mind as I was preparing for today. With that, I wanna make sure that I have everything correct. Is it pronounced SPAT? Do I, yes, sir. I Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. I'm a, Trying to make sure I get everyone's name to the best of my uh, ability. Klein, I think I can handle because I met Judge Klein when he was on the fourth district. So I'm in pretty good shape there. Mr. Espat, did you wish to reserve any time for rebuttal? Judge Castle, no, yes, I would. I would reserve five minutes, please. Okay, thank you so much. With that and the preliminaries <coughs> mentioned, you may begin, counsel. Very well, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court. My name is Mitch Espat, and I represent the Sullivan family as appellants here before Your Honors today, uh, who unfortunately, their three-month-old child sustained injuries while in the care of appellee uh, Carol Bassett, uh, while he was a volunteer uh, with a nonprofit organization. Uh, Judge Casanueva, I've like to go ahead and address your question since uh, you were kind enough to let us know uh, before we started. Uh, obviously, uh, 768.1355 discusses Florida's Volunteer Protection Act, which provides for qualified immunity um, in a situation where a volunteer causes damage or injury to another, provided that three requirements are met. Uh, the first requirement is that the incident or injury occurred uh, while the volunteer, he or she, uh, was in the course and scope of his or her volunteership. Uh, the second element that's also required is the one that Judge Casanueva uh, alerted us to, and that is uh, that the volunteer uh, be acting uh, as a reasonably prudent person would in similar or like circumstances. Uh, the third, of course, uh, is that the volunteer uh, is not acting or was not acting willfully or wantonly uh, in causing the injury. The uh, case that I believe is instructive for us all this morning uh, is the case of Campbell versus Kessler. Uh, and that is found at 848 uh, Southern 2nd uh, 369. It's a 2003 fourth uh, DCA decision. And it realistically is the only case that I found uh, and I believe that Apolli found that really discusses the statutory requirements as we need to this morning. And what it says to all of us is that these requirements are in the conjunctive, uh, not the disjunctive, which means all three of these elements must be met. Uh, to streamline the argument and issues this morning, as I believe I did in the brief, uh, appellants take no issue uh, with item one. Uh, they believe that Mr. Bassett, the Apolli, was acting in good faith in the course and scope of his volunteership. And they take no issue with item three. 
which is the issue of wanton or willful conduct. We don't believe that that's an issue at all. And in fact, the, the lower tribunal was alerted of that. We take issue with the point that Judge Casanueva uh, raised uh, at the outset. And that is that the reasonable person standard, uh, which uh, Judge Casanueva aptly points out, appears to be a common law uh, recitation in the statute. But we do not believe that that uh, somehow uh, has been taken away uh, by virtue of 768.1355 uh, being enacted. And the reason for that is, if we look at the Campbell versus Kessler case, we know that Campbell versus Kessler discusses the fact that it's insufficient for a volunteer to simply allege that they were in good faith uh, in the course and scope of their volunteership uh, when the injury occurred or that they weren't acting intentionally, willfully or wantonly. In fact, the core requirement is the very determination of whether the activities leading to the injury or damage were reasonable. Uh, the statute is in derogation of the common law if in fact uh, it is taking away the common law and therefore it must uh, be very strictly construed. And I addressed that at, at some point in my initial brief, uh, but ultimately uh, when we strictly construe the statute, there's nothing within the statutory language. In fact, the legislative intent uh, as discussed again by the Campbell versus Kessler case, the actual pinpoint site for that, your honors, is 848 uh, Southern 2nd 370 is the actual pinpoint site, which discusses that this reasonable person standard uh, is not something new. It's something that must be assessed in the context of what activity was being done. So there's no elevated requirement. There's no reduced requirement. It is the exact common law requirement that Judge Casanueva alluded to at the very beginning. And what we have here is that the lower tribunal started to and ultimately weighed facts and reached a conclusion when determining the viability of the disputed well, let, material. Let me ask you one question myself. I'm similar in uh, line to Judge Casanueva. The uh, bat, Miss Bassett was asked, weren't there available cribs and beds to put the baby in? And would those have been safer? I believe the answer was, well, it's a matter of opinion. So is that correct? Is it a matter of opinion or is it a matter of common sense or is it a jury question? I believe it's all three. And the reason for that is, is those are the facts that were discussed. And you are correct, Judge Volante, uh, that particular deposition is contained at Record Index 43, and the pages that correspond are pages 147 through 186. And you are correct. That particular line of questioning is exactly, among others, which I'll get to momentarily. Uh, we know, Your Honors, from the Supreme Court case of Witt versus Silverman, uh, which is cited at uh, 788 Southern 2nd 210. That's a 2001 Supreme Court case that discusses that the reasonableness of a defendant's actions is generally within the province of the jury. So if we juxtapose that analysis, Judge Volante, onto your question, uh, the issue of him laying a sleeping three-month-old child uh, across his lap, unsecured by his own admission, and I've, I've cited that throughout the brief, uh, and also in a rocking chair versus um, his knowledge that there were available cribs with side rails to prevent the very thing that occurred here, meaning a baby jerking awake and, and falling. Um, he made a concerted and conscious decision, if you will, to instead of being reasonable, which would be the argument at trial, and securing the baby either with his arms, as opposed to leaving the baby lying across his legs and secure. Let's just take a, a hypothetical, trying to envision what may have happened. Is, is Miss Bassett a humong humongous person where when she sits down, her lap forms a well where really the baby is never going to get out of that well? Yeah, the person the watching the baby was a he. Yes, Your Honor. It's a mister. Oh, okay. It is. He just called Carol, but it's Mister, of my understanding. Oh, okay. Right. Well, let's let's. I apologize. So the I same. I didn't want any confusion to happen. No, no, no. The same question. There's only one caregiver, right? Male yes, or female? Sure. Was this person a large person where the sitting down motion itself would have formed a well where the baby couldn't get out? Was that demonstrated to the court? The court made some observation, or this is all speculation on 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 the part of the uh, the questioner. No, Your Honor, the, the, uh, the body uh, configuration was not discussed nor brought up nor part of the record. 
Okay. So uh, Mr. Bassett's body type and, and that sort of uh, inquiry was not made either by the court or by but, any. So that kind of bolsters your argument. It should have been a jury question. There's nothing to take this away from the jury. Assume your 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 argument lies. In, indeed, Your Honor, and, and Judge Volante, as I said, the, the Supreme Court case which I cited discusses that. We've all known that uh, as practitioners that it's well settled that the determination of whether something is reasonable or not is generally within the province of the jury. The, the Fourth District points out that the legislative intent was clear to, perform, prevent, to provide a form of qualified immunity. When we look at the statute, the question that we have to ascertain is, as a matter of law, statutory interpretation, who makes that determination about qualified immunity? The legislature didn't specifically say a court upon doing so. They used a language from the common law. And when my concern is, if that is the correct reading of that portion of the statute, then the determination of qualified immunity would be best determined, arguably, that's why we're having this argument, um, this discussion, by a jury in a form of a jury questionnaire. Do you find A? Do you find B? Do you find C? If you have found all these, then you have found for qualified immunity and you need to go no further. Correct. Instead, we have a judge granting summary judgment on an issue that is A, customarily by common law decided by a jury. And, and B, secondly, the argument would be raised, did the legislature confer that power and the trial judge true as a matter of law without, eye, without eyeballing any of the witnesses either. It's all on paper on a summary judgment. Those are some of the concerns that prompted my question um, because there's a difference between an intent and arguably an empowerment. Indeed. And, and I, I, Judge Casanova, that's exactly the, the argument that we're advancing that ultimately, uh, and again, understanding the rules of statutory construction, if, if indeed, uh, this statute was intended by the legislature to take away a common law right. Uh, it's an, it, it obviously should have been made expressly clear. The statute is, is unambiguous on its face as to what it requires. And, and moreover, uh, rules of statutory construction require the court to, to narrowly construe it on its own terms based on the fact that it's in derogation of common law, if in fact that's exactly what it's trying to do. We don't believe that it's trying to... to um, to create a, a different rule for, for negligence. Uh, we believe that as with any particular statute, uh, there are sometimes mixed questions of law and fact. And obviously the questions of law are determined by folks such as your honors and the lower tribunal judge. Uh, questions of fact, as I believe both Judge Volante and Judge Casanueva have pointed out this morning are appropriately more determined by the jury. And as it relates to this particular issue, Mr. Bassett, Appley's actions or inactions in doing what he did. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll remind the panel very briefly. I, I know Judge Volante discussed the, the aspect of laying the child, three month old child, across his lap. Um, he, he had uh, discussed and admitted that prior to that time, he had been holding the baby uh, very securely and closely. Uh, he admittedly says, that yeah, I, I agree that I did not have the child in the most secure position, and I readily admit, uh, of course, that I could have used the cribs, but I made a conscious decision not to do that. Um, again, it is a matter of opinion whether he acted reasonably. Well, here's my not. last question. I have one more final question, and I'll leave you alone. Yes, sir. The final judgment is pretty terse. doesn't contain any findings of fact. So the standard on summary judgment is there is no disputed material facts. Did the judge put anything on the record to support no disputed material facts and the undisputed material facts are A, B, and C to support entry of summary judgment or you just get this uh, terse judgment? I believe it's more on the terse end. I believe if memory serves, Your Honor, uh, the lower tribunal indicated that they felt that as a matter of law, the uh, appellee had acted reasonably and had complied with all three of uh, the But not only there's facts, you know, reason, that's a conclusion. Was there any yeah. undisputed facts that the judge found that he put on the record? Not to my knowledge, Your Honor, and, and not as contained uh, in, okay. in the briefs. So uh, again- it, There are two comments found it, uh, by, by the judge uh, on the record transcripts, pages 19 and 20, line 21 on the first page 19. There's no question that Mr. Bassett was acting in good faith within the scope uh, of his official volunteer duties, performed at that place of worship for many years. And at the top, the court's evaluation of whether Mr. Bassett was acting as an ordinary 
reasonably prudent person would have acted under the similar or similar circumstances. And that raises the question of who makes the evaluation. So the judge did try to give us something. Now the question is how much did he give us? Um, and then at the bottom of the page, it was carefully evaluated. I mean, this was a judge trying to do the job with this statute, I guess, before he retired. Oh, that's correct. That's correct. He if, retired I'm the, the, if I'm reading the record um, correctly, and when the trial was, judge was doing this hearing, um, he also inquired whether or not the parties had filed any evidence other than Mr. The Bassett's affidavit and deposition testimony. And counsel said, no, there was nothing else for you to consider. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Uh, we, we noted that the, I apologize, did you have a follow-up, Your Honor? No, go ahead. Yeah, we, we noted that, of course, uh, by Mr. Bassett's own admission, uh, that there were clear facts supporting a breach of the common law duty uh, to use reasonable care. So it's not a situation that requires any sort of expert affidavit or a back and forth with, with experts. The facts themselves, as uh, discussed by Eppley himself, uh, formulate the basis for the lack of reasonable care and the uh, record evidence that a jury, uh, as we've discussed today, uh, would be looking to in their determination of whether or not he breached that duty of care and ultimately was negligent. Uh, I think as th this court discussed as well, uh, most recently in Rodriguez versus Avatar Property and Casualty Insurance, uh, that's uh, 2020. And that's I think found you've touched at, a nerve. <laughs> oh, I, I think apologize. I know who wrote that one. Well, well, and that's at 290 uh, Southern 3rd, uh, 560, Your Honors, and that's uh, 2020. Uh, the problem that this court had and, and the problems we're discussing this morning in all candor is that that particular a situation, uh, the court said, a, a trial judge is not to weigh the evidence, is not to try to determine which is the best evidence. The trial judge's job is to determine whether or not there is sufficient evidence for the jury to make a decision on any given issue that they're supposed to decide. And in this case, uh, as I've stated uh, throughout this uh, oral argument, uh, there's ample evidence from Mr. Bassett himself regarding his inactions, his admission that it wasn't as, uh, the baby wasn't as securely positioned or held, that he made a conscious choice not to use cribs that would have prevented such a fall, but that's the very purpose. And therefore, element two, which again, they're all written in the conjunctive, all three elements need to be satisfied. Element two uh, is not satisfied as a matter of law. Now, I'm not saying that a jury uh, ends up uh, ruling in our favor. I should let you know uh, you're at 15. Thank you. Uh, what I am saying is a jury ought to have the opportunity to make that decision. Because if the situation were reversed, um, where the judge, as a matter of law, found that his actions were unreasonable, uh, the trial judge would be running afoul of the same issues we're discussing today. Because the trial, the, trial side, judge, the trial judge also had the benefit of Mr. Uh, Bassett's uh, history, and he'd been doing this for decades, uh, either in the church or not in the church, and he's not had any one problem. Is that somewhat persuasive? It's persuasive on the end of the, uh, if we're talking about the lower tribunal, those are the arguments, Judge Case, that the defense would make. Uh, the arguments that we would make as plaintiffs below would be that ultimately in this case, the facts speak for themselves and he admits that he didn't act uh, as he should have by not securing the baby. Uh, the baby was unsecured and by not using cribs. And so you are relying of... somewhat in your argument on the Campbell case. Um... Are the facts of that case sufficiently analogous to the facts presented here? The facts are different. The facts in Campbell, as Judge Case points out, involved a citizen patrol driving a vehicle and causing a collision with another vehicle in the course and scope of his volunteership with the sheriff's office. So the facts indeed are distinguishable. The court, the lower court in that case, granted summary judgment, which the fourth DCA overturned. Uh, on the very issues that we're here to decide, and that's whether or not the reasonableness of the actions uh, as performed by the volunteer uh, breached the duty of care at common law to act reasonably as a prudent person would in similar circumstances. And so the fourth DCA overturned it, noting that that's a jury question. But the facts are different. That involved a vehicle accident. This involves a three-month-old baby uh, being, being cared for. But the law is the same. And the legal analysis is the same as it relates to a jury's job in determining whose story to believe, whose story is more credible. And we have in this particular situation, 
facts on both sides, that both sides should be able to argue to a jury regarding the reasonableness or lack thereof of Mr. Bassett's actions. Yeah, so, facts um, on both sides. What did the judge have in, on the record? Well, the judge side on the record. Uh, judge Cates, uh, the, the judge had Mr. Bassett's testimony, which in and of itself, by his virtue of his admissions, and again, his deposition transcript is identified as record index 43, right. and the pages are 146 through 186, I'm sorry, 147 through 186, and his testimony is there, and I've block quoted many of it uh, throughout my both of my briefs, uh, which again, specifically have his admission that he did not secure the baby, that he laid the sleeping baby across his legs. More importantly, that it was foreseeable that a baby would kick and jerk when baby wakes up because in his experience, he, he knew that would happen, yet he did not secure the child, yet he did not uh, obviously uh, put the child in the crib with the rails, which would have prevented any kind of falling or rolling out. So uh, Mr. Bassett himself provides the evidence that allows us to prevail a trial or at least ask the jury uh, for their consideration. What, what should not have been done was the, the trial judge to have made the determination by weighing Mr. Bassett's testimony and, and deciding a, as a matter of law that he acted reasonable. That's that's the, the real issue here. And a jury should get to decide it. And again, whether a plaintiff wins or defense wins below is not the issue. The issue is that a jury should get to decide that. So for those reasons, we would ask that the uh, summary judgment order uh, be reversed and that the final judgment be vacated. Thank you, Your Honors. All righty. Let's see. Okay. Got it to zero. We're good. Okay. Attorney Klein, you're starting on a clean slate. My screen shows that you are now unmiked. Okay. You may proceed. Uh, good morning. Uh, Hinda Klein here on behalf of uh, Mr. Bassett. Um, to start, uh, I'll, I'll address uh, Judge Casanueva your uh, concern about the potential illus illusory nature of this uh, statute. And I have to agree with the court to, to some extent that it is basically illusory. Um, but at, in, in order for us to avail ourselves at, of the qualified immunity, we uh, necessarily need to demonstrate. It doesn't make sense for the legislature to try to award qualified immunity when the general purpose of that is so you don't have to go through a trial to get immunity. And I guess my question got focused in and when I was reading the uh, LA Fitness case out of the same fourth district, it's found at 980 Southern 2nd 550. More particularly, their footnote two, which was talking about the Good Samaritan Act and mm -hmm. an award of qualified immunity. And they said, using the same statutory language of ordinary prudent person, the qualified immunity was only illusory. And, and that's what cre creates a lot of the problem here. We, I can see what the legislature was trying to do. They're trying to make that, that someone who's in the person of this appellee not have to go through an entire trial and or be subject to collection efforts on a judgment when they were doing what good people try to do. The problem I'm concerned with is that they use a, a, a test that under, is it McCain versus Florida Power that says about foreseeable ability, it goes to a trier of fact, basically, that's the general. Rule. And that's my concern as I layer these, and I don't know if I was articulate enough, but that was my concern, you know, that, you know, you hate to use a phrase about a good deed being, you know, they had a noble purpose here. And the question is, did they actually do it right? Or do we need uh, to worry about whether they did it right? Um, I agree with the court, I think. And I've actually thought about this in, uh, in great detail and noted, uh, in fact, there's actually a federal statute that, on which this is patterned. And the, that statute, as well as statutes in other jurisdictions, um, provide the volunteer with immunity as long as they uh, were not willful wanton. And I, and I think, and I'm just saying this off the top of my head, but that's probably what the legislature meant to do because as this is written, I agree with the court that this is somewhat illusory. And really what it boils down to in this case is were, was Mr. Bassett entitled to summary judgment on the issue of whether he was negligent? 
I think that answers both uh, the, the main claim against him as well as uh, the immunity affirmative defense as it is currently written. And uh, while opposing counsel has argued uh, vociferously that this is a question of fact, I would submit that on this rec record, it is not because there is no evidence um, that Mr. Bassett acted unreasonably. Under well, the I have to interrupt you with the, with a question I asked earlier. When, when this gentleman said it's a matter of opinion, wasn't he basically referring to whether what I did was reasonable or sufficient under the circumstances is a matter of opinion? Does that ipso facto say it's a jury question? Uh, I don't. I didn't read his testimony like that, Your Honor. Uh, we're talking about a very. You, just tell me how you read it then. So I well, I, I read it that you know there are numerous ways to hold a baby, and there could be several ways to hold a baby that are reasonable, and whether or not one is better than the other is a matter of opinion, but that doesn't mean that any one is bad and the other is good. And that's- well, Unless he's holding I, the baby by the toes, everything, every other way was reasonable. And is that what you're telling me to take out of that? That these were all reasonable? That was the floor? He didn't well, go below the floor of reasonable? No, no, Your Honor, because I don't believe that the question was asked in the context of holding the baby by the toes. Well, and I, and I'm, I would- I'm paraphrasing. Well, there's nothing inherently wrong or negligent about holding the baby against your chest, which is what he had been doing, and holding the baby in your lap, which necessarily happens when you sit down or happens at least part of the time. Well, I, I guess it, envisioning what happened, trying mm -hmm. to put myself in the shoes of the judge, he was previously holding the baby securely against his chest. There's no way the baby's going to squirm. And if the baby squirmed out under those circumstances, well, then maybe that's reasonable per se. But he puts the baby in his lap, and obviously he's using his hands to do something else. And then it becomes, was that also above the concept of reasonable? And it doesn't get to a jury. Well, first of all, I do want to correct something opposing counsel said. And, and okay. it's at page... Uh, 159 of the record, and actually, the, since this is a mini, it's on page 38, on page 159. And in that, the, Mr. Bassett doesn't testify that the baby was unsecured. He clearly testifies that he had his hands on the baby. And in fact, he, he also testifies uh, he, that he would have had his arm under her head to support her head. Um, and then he said, and I may have taken my arm out from between her legs and had my arm across her torso with my hand on her back. There is no testimony here that he ever didn't have his hands on this baby. Um, and there's, you know, as the court is aware, there's so no- With those facts being the thrust of the argument, and I think it is kind of the concern that, that Judge Case is, is, is putting forth. I look at the language of McCain it says, where reasonable people, I said McCain, yeah, where reasonable persons could differ as to whether the facts established proximate causation, whether the specific injury was genuinely foreseeable or merely an improbable freak, then the resolution of the issue must be left to the fact finder. And what you're arguing is based on what he did, where he had his hands, falls into the latter category. It was just a freak, uh, freak accident. I, I, am I understanding that correct? Do we apply the McCain standard as I articulate? Is that the wrong standard to evaluate when we look at ordinary prudent person? I don't think it's the wrong standard, Your Honor, but um, there's, no, there's no evidence that anything that Mr. Bassett did was below the standard of care. There, there were a number of witnesses that could have been deposed um, or questioned in this matter. There was somebody sitting right next to Mr. Bassett. Um, but yet the only evidence, the only evidence that was before the court after two years of litigation was Mr. Bassett's own testimony. And no testimony 
saying, for example, that uh, we tell our volunteers never to hold babies like that or testimony from an expert that, that says it's, it's foreseeable that a baby will jerk uncontrollably out of the blue or anything on which a jury could hang its hat in finding that whatever Mr. Bassett did and however he held the baby was somehow not reasonably prudent. What, you're, what you would be asking the jury to do in this situation is to simply guess um, be, because there's, there's no standard by which reasonably prudent could be measured here. And that's basically the concern of the trial judge here. He did make um, comments and findings on this record. And one of them was to basically say to the plaintiff, what you're asking me to do is to find that race of soloquitur applies here. The baby fell, therefore it must have fallen because there was some negligence here, but I don't see it. I don't see any evidence of actual negligence. He held the baby a certain way. Where is it written that that is a, a negligence somehow? Babies are held all kinds of different ways. And there's no admission on the part of the plaintiff, uh, of Mr. Bassett, as opposing counsel has argued, that he ever had his hands anywhere but on this child. So I, I think regardless of how the immunity statute is written, the bottom line here is the ultimate question was, was there any evidence of negligence that would have been sufficient to go to a jury? And I would posit there is not. There's nothing on this record, nothing whatsoever. And the only thing that, that's going to happen at the, at, at the trial is that Mr. Bassett is going to testify, presumably consistent with his prior testimony. And then you're going to ask the jury, well, do you think he should have kept the, the child up against his uh, chest? Or was he negligent as a matter of law, putting it in his lap and holding the child? And, and that is not a, a reasonable question for the jury because there is absolutely no evidence that uh, holding the child <clears throat> any particular way would have been uh, something that a reasonably prudent person would do. Again, and maybe I'm, I'm trying to make sure I put this in the right context, much of your argument seems if I, and I don't want to mischaracterize it, that's what I'm gonna say, seems to me to be focused on what McCain talks about being the duty element, which is I think de novo for us to look at as to whether or not um, the defendant's conduct, conduct that would be the appellee here, foreseeably created a broader zone of risk that poses a general threat of harm. And what you're saying that there's no one who said having the baby the way he did creates a, a risk of harm outside the norm. And so you are, are you asking us not, see, my, my concern is the legislature talks about the foreseeability question. And it seems that your argument is at least in part focused on the duty question. And I, I agree, they kind of blend a little bit. But are we on stronger grounds if we try to approach this from a de novo point of view on duty? I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to take a look at McCain, what's happened, and try to put this statute in the context when they use ordinary, reasonably prudent person, which is common law foreseeability, which the courts say in almost all cases, not all, but almost all, that's a jury fact. And I point out, I think Judge Case raises an interesting point. There's no challenge here about anything about the facts. So then are we taking the facts and then looking at duty, which would then be a legal question? You know, I have lots of questions. That's why I'm glad you guys get to answer them all, at least first. <laughs> well, uh, well, Judge, I think if you look at the foreseeability aspect of McKay, um, I think our case is even stronger. The only testimony or evidence on foreseeability was that of Mr. Bassett who testified and that in all of his time as the father of five children and um, uh, and volunteering at nurseries for 20 some odd years, he's never had a baby jerk uncontrollably out of the blue. Uh, and therefore it's not foreseeable. So if, if that's the test, then the only evidence record is that it's not foreseeable. 
Um, I, I, I don't think that you would be, it would be appropriate to ask the jury to divine that uh, from the air. There still has to be evidence on which a jury could rest a verdict. It's just not enough, as I understand the law, to simply say it's a negligence case, it's always a question of fact, because sometimes where the facts are undisputed as they are here, there really isn't a question of fact because the jury can't reasonably render a verdict um, in, in the plaintiff's favor on this. There's no evidence of a standard of care breach and there's no evidence um, of foreseeability. So I think big picture that the trial judge was absolutely correct in granting summary judgment. Uh, and if the court has no further questions, I would respectfully request that the court affirm that summary judgment. Let me check my screen. I see no further questions. I, I thank you for, I guess, bearing with all of us here. We'll go to rebuttal. Uh, let me do my, uh, you have three minutes remaining, counsel. Very well, thank you, Judge Casanueva. I wanna touch on the heels of the McCain versus Florida Power discussion that y'all were having. And if memory serves, that's a 1992 Supreme Court case. And it discusses the aspect of, of the creation of a foreseeable zone of risk and therefore a commensurate duty with that creation of a risk. Uh, I don't think, uh, well, I guess the way I should put it is there is actually record evidence of that. Um, and I can tell you that again, uh, if you look at uh, Mr. Carol Bassett's deposition, uh, within his transcript, it would be pages 32 through 34. Again, it's record index 43, starting at page 147. But it, he's, he's asked and he concedes uh, that three month old babies were known to him and expected to move their arms and kick their legs. And that is why he had specifically held Appellant's baby securely up against his chest and his arms. And so we go from his knowledge again, as Judge Case pointed out earlier, this gentleman, uh, it's not the first time he'd ever been dealing with babies. He, he's been doing this for a while, his own family, if no other uh, uh, experience. So he knew about that. So we have this foreseeability aspect. And then he creates this foreseeable zone of risk by laying the baby across his legs. I interrupt admitting, you on that one point. Yes, just one. He laid the baby across his lap. I thought the record said the baby was unsecured across his laps. I got the impression from the prior discussion of the opposing counsel that he might have had one or both hands somehow under or on top near the baby as opposed to doing nothing with his hands in regards to the baby. He did not recall in all candor, Your Honor, uh, specifically how he held the baby, uh, uh, but he did admit unequivocally, and I will share this, this is direct quote from his testimony. Uh, again, this would be in his deposition, uh, page 35, lines 12 through 16. The record site is, again, record index 43, page 148. Uh, would you agree with me that the position you originally had the Sullivan child in, as you described with your arms up against your chest, was a more secure position than having her lay on your lap before she fell to the ground? Answer, definitely. Um, he's asked in other portions of his deposition if he recalled how he was holding the baby, if at all, on his lap. And, and he was equivocal at best as to, uh, again, whether he did or did not have hands on the child, uh, which again gets into the issue of credibility for a jury to decide. But, but even notwithstanding that, uh, the issue- well, it gets into a disputed issue of material fact. Maybe a material fact would require a reasonably prudent person to have hands on the baby at all times, even if it was in a large lap, but we, we don't have those answers. Or more to the point, uh, available cribs with side rails, which he indicated the specific use uh, of those was to avoid the very incident that occurred. I mean, he has knowledge of that again with the wealth of experience that Judge Case pointed out earlier during my initial discussion. So uh, again, on the heels of McCain's foreseeable, uh, foreseeable zone of risk creation and a commensurate duty with that, uh, he knew that it's a more secure position in a crib. Here's the problem with that argument. I mean, there's a bar above which every position is secure. Beds, cots, holding the baby this way. And then there's a bar below which no position is secure. So when I you know, said something about holding the baby by the toes, well, that's below the bar of, of reasonably prudent person. But where is the defining line? And that's usually something the jury would decide. And that's the problem I'm having with this factual scenario. And I agree uh, with you, Judge Alanti. The jury should decide this because, again, we also have elements 
that he was aware that three-month-old ch children uh, tend to kick and move around. And so when he put the child by his own admission, I've just read the court his testimony directly, on the lap in a less secure position versus either holding them, holding the child more securely or putting the child in available cribs, which he testified the very purpose of those was for the children not to fall out because they had side rails. That's the issue. And that's the type of uh, evidence that a jury ought to be able to you know, decide whether or not he breached the standard of care. And of course, our argument is that he did. Uh, but whether we're right or wrong, the jury uh, does get to decide that issue. And so again, for the reasons we've discussed, uh, unless there are any other questions, we again would request the summary judgment be reversed and the final judgment be vacated. Uh, thank you all for your attention this morning. Thank you all. Thank you for uh, handling a very difficult case, uh, present some very interesting and challenging viewpoints and how to handle this. I appreciate all your input and I think I speak for the panel on that regard. And thank be safe out there. Much. Likewise. We will move.